Welcome, everyone. Thanks uh, for braving the threat of one inch of snow. I know everybody's here <laughs> wondering whether or not the, the supermarket shelves are going to be bare when you get out. Um, but welcome to the New America Foundation. Um, my name is Patrick Doherty, and I run the Smart Strategy Initiative here, a small project that's looking at uh, new constructs for American grand strategy uh, in the first part of the 21st century. Um, but with my other hat, I also help uh, run uh, part of our counterterrorism strategy initiative, and it's with that hat that I'm, I'm really pleased to be here with this distinguished panel. Um, you know, before I do introductions, let me just take a moment to set the stage. Um, nine years ago today, the Bush administration received the first de detainees in a new detention facility at U.S. Naval Station Guantanamo Bay. It was one of the first pieces of the new architecture created to support the global war on terror. Since that day, nine years ago, Guantanamo has become a symbol of the war on terror. For those who believe that the terrorist threat is the defining challenge of our time, Guantanamo is both a tool in that war and a symbol that America must do what it takes to win. For others, Guantanamo represents the opposite, a frontal assault on our constitutional order. It's a persistent sign um, uh, and a, of a dangerous compromise. Today it appears that President Barack Obama is more in the latter camp than the former, but that domestic politics is tempering his willingness to push back. Nevertheless, the White House has made a strong case for changing course. In his national security strategy released in April of last year, the president said we must rebuild the foundation of our strength and influence in large part by living up to our own constitutional values. His counterterrorism advisor, John Brennan, speaking in August of 2009, articulated a simple basic framework. We are neither in a global war nor are we in a war on terror. Um, rather, America is in a much more circumscribed conflict with al-Qaeda and its affiliates in a variety of failed states, a fight that will require different tools, uh, but for which war is not always indicated. Furthermore, Brennan said, America needs to focus much more on the upstream factors that drive recruitment, factors which many would argue include the treatment and disposition of prisoners at Guantanamo Bay. If the political and policy rhetoric over Guantanamo Bay is charged, the legal debate is even more complex. Guantanamo was opened and populated with little regard for evidence, and many were detained without cause. Interrogations there routinely use techniques, many argue amount to torture. The Geneva Conventions form the basis for detainees' rights, yet the Supreme Court has asserted some jurisdiction over the cases there. Big question remains, are these, crimi are these individuals criminals or warriors? These are some of the questions that we're going to touch on today with this distinguished panel that, that Andy has, has uh, helped gather here for us today at the New America Foundation. I'm also going to use this moment just to alert you to a report that we had. Hopefully you got, grabbed a copy of it out front. Um, the New America Foundation, my colleagues Peter Bergen, Catherine Tiedemann, and Andrew Leibovich have released a new report on Guantanamo recidivism to mark the anniversary um, and this event. Um, and to just give you the top line numbers, where the, whereas the, the U.S. government is the Department of Defense and the, the uh, Director of National Intelligence is reporting a 25 percent recidivism rate, um, our numbers, um, after a, a, a thorough scouring of the open source, uh, are reporting that um, it's about approximately 8 percent, um, much significantly lower than what uh, the DNI uh, is out there on record saying. Um, so that's going to be released uh, formally on foreignpolicy.com tonight, um, so you can get that there, and then we'll be releasing it on our website as well with the appendices to show the data behind it. I just wanted to share that with everyone there. So what I'm going to do now is just do a quick, some quick introductions, and then we'll get to it. Um, I'm going to start off um, with Andy Wor introducing Andy Worthington. Um, he's a freelance journalist and author, um, writing frequently for The Guardian and the Huff Huffington Post. Um, his book, The Guantanamo Files, uh, was released in 2007. It's the story of 774 detainees in Guantanamo. Um, he also co-directed the 2009 documentary, uh, Outside the Law, Stories from Guantanamo. Um, and uh, today, I believe he was uh, outside the walls uh, down at the White House. Um, 
Next, we'll be hearing from Colonel Morris Davis, um, Air Force, former Air Force Colonel, mm -hmm. sir, um, and former Chief Prosecutor uh, for the U.S. Military Commissions at Guantanamo. Um, he retired in 2008, is now the Executive Director of the Crimes of War Education Project. Um, following him will be Ben Wittes, Benjamin Wittes, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he authored Detention and Denial, The Case for Candor After Guantanamo Bay. Um, I think that came out in December of last year? Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> somewhere there. Um, and uh, he's, he's focusing on uh, uh, a variety of issues, uh, including the Guantanamo Bay detention questions. Um, and then finally, wrapping up, will be um, Thomas Wilner, a partner at Sher Sherman and Sterling, uh, based in New York City. Um, and he represented... Uh, the Guantanamo uh, detainees in the Rasul v. Bush and the Boumedien v. Bush cases, um, and um, and is often frequently um, published in the Washington Post and the New York Times. So, with that, I'm going to turn the the podium over to Andy Worthington, um, uh, and uh, please uh, give him a round of applause. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's very interesting for me to be here on January the 11th. I've not been here before. I've usually been outside the U.S. Embassy in London. Um, I, I'm disappointed that I have to be here, of course, because uh, two years ago it seemed feasible when President Obama swept into office and issued executive orders that included um, stating that Guantanamo would be closed within a year um, that that would happen. It was certainly feasible, I think, but um, inaction and opposition from certain quarters prevented it. Um, the the last year that that deadline was missed, um, and so here we are a year on. And um, are, are we in a position where we should have hope that Guantanamo will be closed in the imminent future? Well, I have to say that we're not. That the picture looks extremely bleak at the moment. Um, so what I'd like to do is just run through um, a brief analysis of who is at Guantanamo, um, what the government says it intends to do with those people and what the situation actually is. There are 173 men still held at Guantanamo. Three of them either um, were convicted after a trial by a military commission um, or accepted a plea deal. Um, so they are serving sentences separate to the uh, the rest of the prisoners who the government has decided what it wants to do about them. And it did that by establishing the Guantanamo Review Task Force, uh, which spent a year deliberating about the cases of the men held there, um, composed of 60 um, lawyers and other officials from various government departments and from the intelligence agencies, and they went through the cases and submitted a report to the, to the president saying what they thought should happen to the remaining men. Now of those 170, 89 of them, the task force uh, said should be released. Um, they didn't quite use those words. I don't think lawyers like to go anywhere near the word cleared when it comes to Guantanamo prisons. They were approved for transfer. Um, it meant the government said that it didn't want to keep holding these men. So why are they still held? Um, um, and actually a side question from that is why do we not hear that before anything else when we hear the stories about all the dangerous men who are still held in Guantanamo that over half of them the government itself have said it wants to release but these 89 men 58 of them are Yemenis um, the task force uh, demonstrating the caution that's always been present with the Yemeni prisoners actually divided them into two categories the Yemenis are in, uh, in the majority in Guantanamo. 89 of the remaining prisoners are Yemenis. Um, only 23 have been released throughout Guantanamo's history. There were comparable numbers of Saudis there, and most of them were rehabilitated, were re repatriated and put through a rehabilitation program in 2006-2007. But very few of the Yemenis have been released. There have always been fears about um, the instability of Yemen. But the task force um, said that 58 of these men should be released. It said 30 of them were in a, a kind of conditional detention category and they shouldn't be released until security, the security situation was regarded as sufficiently stable, but that 28 should be released immediately. 
Um, almost at exactly the same time that the report was issued, a man from Nigeria tried to blow himself up on an aeroplane uh, Christmas Day last year. Um, and the president, in response to um, hysterical overreaction to the Yemeni connection, um, um, introduced a moratorium on releasing any Yemenis. Um, that's why these men are still held. Now, it's a year since that moratorium was issued, um, and it seems entirely inappropriate to me that the government uh, authorizes people for release and then doesn't release them. Uh, we have no sign of when, if ever, this moratorium um, is being considered for any kind of review. Will it ever come to an end? Um, I think it's very important that those men, those 28 men at least, are released and, um, and all the fear mongering that goes on should be put aside, all these fears that they will return to the battlefield, um, to mention this important report that's just come out. Um, those are the Yemenis. The, the other 31 men um, who have been cleared for release but are still held, um, I can't tell you exactly who they are and where they're from because the exact details of who are the people that were put into these various categories by the task force have not been released. But the majority of them, um, it, it's certain, are from countries that it's not safe for them to be returned to. Um, this is a problem for many of the prisoners. And what the Obama administration has done um, over, the last, o over these last two years is to find new homes in third countries for these men in quite significant numbers. I believe 36 uh, former prisoners have now been rehoused in 15 different countries around the world, um, in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, various other places. Um, these 31 men, presumably many of them, what is happening is that there are negotiations underway with other countries. Some of these men, I am sure, will be released. Um, one of them was actually released on Monday, um, but that wasn't really much of a triumph for anyone. This was a man called Farhai Saeed bin Mohammed, an Algerian who had won his habeas corpus petition but was desperate not to be returned to his home country. Um, his judge had actually um, tried to um, prevent his forcible repatriation to Algeria. It went all the way to the Supreme Court last summer, and the Supreme Court refused to stop the administration releasing people to Algeria. So he was sent home, and he didn't want to go there. And there were other countries that may well have been prepared to take him. Um, but some of these people will be taken. My my suspicion is that the um, is that the well of generosity of countries around the world will dry up before the, all these men are released, that, you know, 15 countries have already taken people to help out the United States. Um, I'm not sure that there are enough countries to go around to take all of these people, which would leave them held indefinitely at Guantanamo unless some other solution can be found. Um, and it strikes me that there is a solution to that, but it's not one that's popular with people in a position of power and authority in the United States, which is that if they can't be found a home somewhere else, then uh, they should be given homes in the United States. Now, there is some kind of history to, to this, because um, in, 2000, in October 2008, in the first habeas uh, ruling in the district court here in Washington, D.C., it was the case of 17 Uyghurs. These are, these are uh, Muslims from China's Xinjiang province. And Judge Ricardo Urbina ordered those men to be brought to the United States. He, he, um, he said, look, you haven't found anywhere else that will take them. It is unconstitutional to hold them at Guantanamo. Um, but th that was appealed by the Bush administration. It was appealed by the Obama administration. And importantly, what happened was that the Justice Department opposed it. The D.C. Circuit Court upheld um, those arguments that were put forward by the Justice Department. Congress has repeatedly said that it wants no truck with any notion of bringing people to live here in the U.S. mainland. And President Obama himself quashed a plan by White House counsel Greg Craig to do so in the early months of the administration. Um, so that's pretty much, um, pretty much set the seal on the fact that there's no interest at high levels in doing that. But I would say as a, as a moral question, um, it would be entirely appropriate for the American people to say, We've had a lot of countries around the world helping out. It might be appropriate if we did it. So those are the cleared prisoners. <clears throat> the other men who are held 
there are 33 men who were put forward for trials by the task force. Um, they didn't specify which kind of trials. Um, those of us who were hopeful that President Obama had a, a, a great respect for the law when he came into office thought that there would only be one trial system on offer, which would be federal court trials, which is the appropriate venue for um, terrorist trials. Um, but President Obama, having suspended the military commissions, which had been introduced by Dick Cheney in November 2001, had um, limped on until they were ruled illegal by the Supreme Court, had been brought back from the dead, zombie-like, by Congress, um, had then stumbled through 2007, 2008 from one ridiculous farce to another uh, with no credibility, uh, were revived by the Obama administration. So the 33 men could face trials in one or other of, of these venues. But in fact, what's happened is that um, federal court trials are very unpopular with Republicans and military commissions are very unpopular with progressives and liberals. Those are, those are broad lines. I wouldn't say that there aren't people on other sides who have different views on them, but they're, they're not popular with, with just about everybody one way or another. Um, now, I understand all the reasons why the military commissions are unpopular, because I don't think they should have been revived. I think their history has been so dreadful. I'm, I'm sure that, that Mo's going to talk about them later. Um, and I think that what happened in October was an absolutely disgraceful black mark against the administration, because Omar Khadr, who was a child, child when he was seized, was held as a child prisoner, <coughs> um, was, um, was accepted a plea deal, um, to prevent the embarrassment of an actual trial. And, um, and as part of his plea deal, he had to accept that he was an alien, unprivileged enemy belligerent at the time that he was caught in a firefight with U.S. forces in Afghanistan in July 2002. Um, he essentially had to admit that there, was no, there were no circumstances under which he was allowed to be in combat with U.S. forces, um, which on top of him being a child soldier, a child prisoner, um, is just pretty disgraceful, really, because he was 15 when he was captured. Um, he, at the time he was captured, the U.S. had not signed up to the optional protocol on the rights of the child in armed conflict, but they signed that six months later, and it states explicitly that countries are required to rehabilitate rather than punish child prisoners, and those are prisoners who are under the age of 18 when their alleged crimes take place. So understandably, I think the administration got a black eye from the result of the Obama of the uh, uh, the CADA decision, and doesn't want to go ahead with military commissions. But neither have they found a way to go ahead with federal court trials. Fourteen months ago, Eric Holder said that he was going to have federal court trial for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four other men accused of involvement in the 9/11 attacks. I mean, what this whole war on terror was supposed to be about. They didn't move swiftly on that. The opposition to it built up and built up. It became a political issue. It was taken away from Holder. The White House has been sitting on it. They made no decision. Congress then, before Christmas, um, inserted a prov provision into the defense um, funding bill to say that no prisoner can be brought to Guantanamo to face a trial. And they explicitly mentioned Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in it. Um, so those have been blocked as well. So the men who should be facing trials are apparently not going to be tried. Um, so all the people I've spoken about so far seem to be indefinitely detained at Guantanamo for the foreseeable future and possibly forever. And the last category of prisoners are, are definitely going to be held there indefinitely without charge or trial because that's what the task force decided they should be. 48 men, the task force said, should continue to be held indefinitely without charge or trial. There are ways of dressing up the language that they use to explain why, but what they essentially said was, these pe we think these people are too dangerous to release, but what we regard as evidence would not stand up in any court. Um, now, under any circumstances, that would ring alarm bells to me. It would suggest that if you haven't got evidence that can be used in a court, then it's not actually evidence. Um, it's something that you're trying to dress up as evidence, but that isn't substantial enough. And I think that when you look at the history of Guantanamo and the history of how the evidence compiled by the government has been gathered and the quality of it, um, you would be very suspicious indeed that, that, there, that those reasons are trustworthy. 
and that we should take at face value the words of the president or his task force. Trust us, we have 48 guys and we really just have to keep holding them because they're so dangerous. But we can't really tell you why and we can't justify it. And it isn't just from, you know, from my words or my research or my writing that you could read about why I would have my doubts about this or why you would hear doubts from some of the panellists here today about the quality of the evidence. You will also find that if you examine the rulings that have been made in the district court on the prisoner's habeas corpus petitions because there have been a number of those cases where what the judges have discovered and they've had access to information that isn't publicly available to interrogators' reports to this whole background of the, of the prisoner's detention and where the allegations came from. They have discovered time and again um, that, the, that all the, statement, that the statements that the government is relying on are unreliable. Um, they are produced through, by the prisoners themselves or by their fellow prisoners. Um, there has been coercion. There has been torture. There are people who are used as informants by the government who government agencies have themselves um, said are unreliable, and yet they are used time and time again in habeas cases. The judges have now reached the point where they've gone, oh, no, it's him again. We've seen his supposed evidence in a habeas case recently. Um, there are so many reasons to doubt the quality of what the government asserts as evidence against these men that, to me, it's on that basis alone the claim that um, there's any justification for holding 48 men indefinitely without charge or trial is alarming. I think it becomes even more alarming when you realize that nine years on from what President Bush did, which was, of course, to set up a place that was based on indefinite detention without charge or trial, President Obama um, is now thinking of formalizing that um, and the executive order is apparently being planned, which he may sign imminently, which will give these men some kind of review process. Um, but that will that is going to make it easier for people who are happy with the idea of indefinite detention without charge or trial to take that idea forward. And I think the big problem from the very, very beginning has been that you know the f one of the fundamental problems with the war on terror was that it attempted to claim that you could hold people indefinitely without charge or trial, um, as well as having created this problem of holding people without rights who were neither criminal suspects nor prisoners of war. Um, and th that hasn't been addressed either. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm deeply disturbed by that, but overall I'm just, you know, fundamentally depressed to have analyze the situation of the men there and to have realized that um, without some new movement on this, without some new arguments, without some new activity, um, I, could be, I could be rolling up here a year from now and we could have found that in the meantime only, maybe only one or two people have been released and that there is no sign that this place is ever going to come to an end. And I don't think that, that I think that every day that a place like Guantanamo is open um, is an insult to values that decent American people hold. Um, and I don't think that it's appropriate to be complacent that maybe Guantanamo is something that will, uh, at nine years that will last 15 years, that maybe 20 years, that we can't see a way out. It's rather complicated. It's politically difficult. Um, I don't think that's enough. I think I think new moves need to be made to close the place, and um, and I hope that some of you agree, having heard my analysis of quite what's going on there. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate everyone coming out today. I know, having lived in D.C. for a while, I know just the mention of the word snow and people begin to panic and uh, heading for the grocery store and heading for home. So, you know, Andy mentioned that uh, a lot of people in a position of power have very little interest in Guantanamo. I think there's even less interest amongst the general public. So the fact that you take time out on a day when there is snow in the forecast to come out, I, I appreciate you having that interest.
How's that? Is that any better? Nope. I can't control the volume. I don't know if somebody in the... Yeah, we've got a... Mike's working on it in the back. Okay. Um, ah, how's that? I want you to take a little bit of a historical look. As we go on, we're going to talk about the future of Guantanamo, but this is the ninth anniversary, so I'd like to take a little bit of a look back and reflect on why are we here? You know, in 2011, why are we sitting here? I can tell you, I asked myself the question when I was chief prosecutor. I remember I was on the ferry going over across to the main part of the base, and I was asking myself, how did I get here? Well, if you go back to April 30th of 1494, <laughs> Columbus, on his second voyage to the New World, landed at Guantanamo Bay. In fact, if you've been there, there's a marker down at the ferry landing on, called Fisherman's Point where Christopher Columbus landed on April 30th, 1494. He looked around, the next day he left, and he never came back. <laughs> 512 years later, on January 7th, 2006, I arrived at Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> and within five minutes, I knew that Columbus was a wise man. <laughs> Really, I think what brought us to Guantanamo Bay, uh, you can trace back to June of 1942. In June of 1942, a German submarine surfaced off the coast of New York, and some men got off. And then it proceeded to Florida, and some more men got off, the eight Nazi saboteurs. Many of you are probably familiar with the case of Ex parte Kieran. The real lead character in that story, though, was a man by the name of George Dash. He was part of a group that, the group that got off in New York. And the Nazi saboteurs were doomed from the beginning because George Dash had decided he wasn't going to go through with the plot. He saw an opportunity to be a hero. He was going to reveal the plot. So he convinced his partner that rather than carry out the acts of sabotage, that they would go to the FBI and report what was about to happen. Now, Dash came to here in Washington on June the 19th of 1942 thinking he would be meeting with J. Edgar Hoover and he'd be greeted as a hero at the FBI. But instead, the agents he met with were very skeptical of his story until he produced $82,000 in cash and began writing what became a 254-page single-space typewritten statement about the plot. And then by June 27th of 1942, all eight of the saboteurs were in the custody of the FBI. On July the 2nd of 1942, President Roosevelt signed a military commission order authorizing the trial of the Nazi saboteurs before a military commission. That military commission was held just down the street here. If you go to the main justice building, room 5235, there's a little plaque that commemorates it. That was the room where the trial of the Nazi saboteurs took place. They were personally prosecuted. The lead, uh, lead prosecutor was the Attorney General Francis Biddle. Now, the youngest member of the prosecution team, those of you that have been a part of the Washington legal community for a while, know Lloyd Cutler. And Mr. Cutler was the junior member of the prosecution back in 1942. Leading the defense was Colonel Kenneth Royal, which I'm from North Carolina, and I'm pleased to say Colonel Royal was also from North Carolina, but it was his job to defend the eight saboteurs. President Roosevelt's order forbid going to federal court. Colonel Royal did anyway. The military commission began on July the 9th in secret, behind closed doors, where no one could see what was taking place. Now, Colonel Royal lost out when he went to district court, but by the end of July, he'd convinced the Supreme Court to hear the case. So there was nine hours of oral argument before the Supreme Court. It began on July the 29th and continued over into July the 30th. And then the court ruled from the bench in an oral opinion on July 31st that said the president did have the authority to proceed with the military commissions for the eight Nazi saboteurs. Four days later, on August 3rd, they were convicted. Dash, who thought he was going to be a hero, was sentenced to death for being a saboteur. Ultimately, President Roosevelt pardoned Dash and his partner since they had come forward and revealed the plan, but the other six men were sentenced to death, and on August 8, 1942, they were strapped into an electric chair not far from here and killed, and their bodies were buried in unmarked graves down by the Anacostia River. The Supreme Court decision in Ex parte Kieran was released on October 29, 1942, which was 12 weeks after the men were executed and buried. 
If you read the story, you'll see the Supreme Court had a lot of trouble coming up with a rationale for their written opinion. But nonetheless, from July, June 27th, when the eight men were in custody, until August the 8th, when they were buried, it was a total of 43 days that elapsed from capture to trial through the Supreme Court to the graveyard. That's what the Bush administration looked to in 2001. They looked back to 1942 at the military commission that convicted the eight Nazi saboteurs quickly, quietly, and behind closed doors. If you look at the order that President Roosevelt signed in 1942 and compare it to the order that President Bush signed in November of 2001, if you submitted the two, or submitted the, the new one as a uh, legal paper, you'd be accused of plagiarism. It was essentially the same order. It didn't take account of things like the Geneva Convention and Miranda and all the other legal rights and developments that had taken place over the next 60 years. What it also ignored was the second group of Nazi saboteurs that most people aren't familiar with. In November of 1944, another German submarine popped up off the coast, this time of Maine, and two saboteurs got off the boat. Like the first group, they were captured in an FBI custody in short order. Now, Attorney General Biddle, who had successfully prosecuted the original group of saboteurs, was ready and able and willing to proceed and do the same thing again in 1944. But Secretary of Defense Henry Stimson went to the president and said, I object. The reason he objected and what he convinced the president of was that if we employ this extraordinary process, this unusual process, then Americans that were being detained by the enemy could justifiably say, well, if you're making up the rules for our people, we'll make up rules for yours as well and subvert the normal court process. President Roosevelt agreed, so when he had a second opportunity to repeat the military commission he'd done in 1942, he chose a different course. As I mentioned, the original military commission in 1942 was convened by the president. This time, he turned the military commission over to the military. It was convened by Major General Thomas Terry. Rather than being tried in the DOJ building down the street, the trial was held at Fort J, New York. It was prosecuted by military attorneys, defended by military attorneys, and when it was over, the case went through the normal court-martial appellate review process. Now, both men were convicted and sentenced to death. In the interim, President Roosevelt died, and President Truman commuted the sentences to confinement for life. Now, interestingly, of the two saboteurs that were convicted, originally sentenced to death, con commuted to life, in the early 1960s, William Colepaw was released from prison. He settled in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, and became a successful businessman and, a, and an officer in the Rotary Club. So this notion that people can't be rehabilitated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned Lloyd Cutler was the youngest member of the prosecution in 1942. Mr. Cutler wrote an op-ed in, Dece in December 2001. It was a month after President Bush signed the order authorizing military commissions. It was about a week and a half before the first detainees got off the airplane at Guantanamo Bay. And his op-ed was in the Wall Street Journal, and Mr. Cutler reflected back on the lessons that he'd learned six decades earlier, having participated in the trial of the eight Nazi saboteurs. He said the Bush administration should allow the accused access to the federal courts. They should minimize secret proceedings and make it as open and transparent as possible, and that each accused should have a right to competent, conflict-free re representation by counsel of the accused's choice. And he concluded his op-ed by saying, quote, in a very real sense, it's the American legal system, not just al-Qaeda leaders that will be on trial. Mr. Cutler passed away a few years ago, but I think if he was standing here today, nine years after he wrote that op-ed, he'd say the verdict is not pretty about the American legal system and the way it's handled the detainees at Guantanamo Bay. If you look at the way this has worked out, as I mentioned, they. The Bush administration saw this order from 1942. They saw a process that ran its course in 43 days in secret. And I can tell you, having been chief prosecutor and talked with some of the officials that were involved, they were shocked that we weren't able to get this, you know, the military didn't jump in and get this done in secret and quickly and it would all be over and done. 
the people objected, like Colonel Royal. Remember Colonel Royal? The order said he couldn't go to federal court, and he went all the way to the Supreme Court. Charlie Swift did the same thing in the Hamden case. If you compare the Bush administration's record in court with the detainee's record, and as Mr. Wilner can tell you, they've had a pretty good record in the Supreme Court. From Hamdi to Hamdan to Boumediene, the detainees have won. I was looking at SCOTUS blog today, and, it, and if, if their numbers are right, there have been 38 uh, habeas petitions that have been reviewed. Detainees have won 29 out of 38. Now remember, is that not right? It's not correct. What's, what's the? It's uh, 28, 19. It's, it's, I mean, it, well, it depends how you count the Uyghur cases, but it's, it, it, it's with the Uyghur places, it's probably 38, 18, without 36, 18, something like no, that, no, without no, no. the Uyghur cases. <laughs> no, 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 wait a second. It's, it's well over 60 to 70%, so it's not 50% wins. It's, it's well over 70% wins. If you could put the leaguers in, yeah. Yeah, that's what I just said. No, no, but you said 36, 18. That would be 50%. I think it's 36, 22 or something. I mean, it's... Yeah. Okay. okay, well... 70%. Somebody can Google it in the audience. <laughs> yeah, I guess the point I was trying to make here is, remember, <laughs> these were the men that were the worst of the worst. You know, the hardcore criminal uh, terrorists that would chew through the hydraulic lines on the airplane in order to kill Americans. Yeah. Yet, at least 50%... Judges have concluded, not just a judge, but no, a man, we, we just we agree. He said thirty-six wins, eighteen losses, so two to one. There's a ra yeah. round number. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it's two to yeah. one. Basically. Two to one. Yeah. Two to one. But again, if you yeah. accept Donald Rumsfeld's statement that these are the worst of the worst, the hardcore terrorists that would do anything to kill Americans, and a system that was largely willing just to ignore them and take the administration's word for it, when they've had their day in court, a significant number have prevailed and the government's lost. And I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are eight cases currently pending at the Supreme Court. There's some, there's some, I don't know if it's eight, yeah. but there's yeah. some. I mean, what we had for a number of years was an executive branch that was drunk on a thirst for power, a legislative branch that was too cowardly to, to fulfill its role in our system of checks and balances, and a judiciary that when push came to shove stood up and said the rule of law is not some quaint theoretical concept that we apply when it's convenient. And it's fortunate that the courts had the guts to stand up and do that. Guantanamo was not, as some people believe, beyond the reach of the law. I mean, that was why it was selected to avoid the law. Military commissions were not, as some people believe, fast and easy. They've been anything but. You know, it's been nine plus years since President Bush signed the order authorizing military commissions. We've completed a grand total of five trials. Two of those trials, Hamden and Hicks, received what by most standards would be considered misdemeanor punishments. They're both convicted war criminals, but they're both free men back in their home countries, where another 171 men are still at Guantanamo. That was one of the jokes that we used to make about Guantanamo. In order to win, you got to lose. You got to go to court and be convicted as a war criminal and you might have a shot at going home. But if you don't get your day in court and you don't get convicted, then you may stay there forever. Of the nearly 800 men that were ever detained at Guantanamo over the past nine years, as, as Andy said, there's still 173 that remain there. At this point in time, I don't think the question is what could we do in these circumstances. After nine years of failure, the question is what should we do? I think our reputation uh, has been tarnished by what we've done at Guantanamo Bay. I don't know if you noticed, Secretary of State Clinton criticized the Russians, you know, the Yukos oil executive that was prosecuted a second time. I don't know how we stand up with a straight face and criticize others as long as we keep Guantanamo Bay open and people detained without ever setting foot in a courtroom. I think part of restoring our reputation means we stop ignoring that we tortured people. You know, the Obama administration came in with a lot of lofty rhetoric about what it was going to do about Guantanamo. I saw today where Secretary of State Clinton in Yemen said, President Obama is absolutely serious about closing Guantanamo. I don't know why he's absolutely serious now, and maybe he was just serious in 2009, but the fact remains Guantanamo is still open and there doesn't appear to be any end in sight. As I said, I think 
one thing we need to do to restore our reputation is to confront the fact that we engaged in torture. There have been five different judges that I know of, military and civilian, that have concluded that detainees were tortured. You've had a number of government officials, and not liberal officials, Bush administration officials. Susan Crawford was the convening authority for the military commissions when I resigned. In January of 2009, about a week before President Bush left office, in an interview with Bob Woodward in the Washington Post, Ms. Crawford said, explain why she didn't refer the case of Mohammed al Qatani to trial. Ms. Crawford, who had been Dick Cheney's Inspector General at the Defense Department, said, we tortured al Qatani." The Convention Against Torture, the Torture Statute, and the War Crimes Act say that we have a duty to investigate and prosecute allegations of torture, but for some reason we just ignore that obligation. It doesn't say if it's convenient or when you get around to it, you do it. It says you have a duty to do it, and I think we're being hypocrites as long as we continue to ignore the fact that we engaged in torture. It's been interesting lately, if you saw, there's an interview with John Yu not too long ago where he said, hey, look, you know, I was just a lawyer. I was asked to provide advice on a range of options, and I provided an opinion. I wasn't the decision maker. If you saw the interview with President Bush here recently, he said, hey, look, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just the decision maker. They, you know, they laid out the options. So you've got plausible deniability where nobody's accountable and nobody's responsible. And this is America. That's not the way we operate. We need to restore our reputation. We need to do the right thing. And as long as Guantanamo is open, we're not there. Benjamin. So I'm, I'm standing before you with the sort of mischievous trepidation of the devil addressing a, a Baptist Church on Sunday morning. Um, <laughs> but with that as a preface, I, I would like to say a few words, A, in defense of preventive detention without trial, even on an indefinite basis. B, to try to persuade you that Guantanamo is uh, not the biggest problem in the world um, and actually is something of a misdirected um, anxiety um, and sort of misstates what the problem is. And third, that this, as a consequence, the entire discussion that we have had, or a very large portion of the discussion that we've had over the last bunch of years, has really missed very important points. Um, so let me, you know, I, 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 did, I, I, don't, I don't expect to convince you of any of that, but let me, let me give it a, the 10 minute try, and I'm gonna keep this very brief. Um, Number one, um, Guantanamo is a naval base. Um, yes, I acknowledge it's become a symbol, but it's a detention facility. It's not at the end of the day um, a place of inherent evil. Um, in fact, it has a certain set of distinctions among U.S. detention facilities. It's the only one that uh, federal courts exercise habeas jurisdiction over. Um, it's the only one that's regularly visited by, you know, hundreds and hundreds of journalists um, who go there and, and cover proceedings. It's the only one where um, detainees have access to lawyers. Um, and so, you know, fr from a pure, from the pure point of view of ensuring fair process for detainees, the mantra close Guantanamo is very peculiar and what we should all be saying as sort of good civil libertarians, if we were looking at it purely without a symbolic lens on our glasses, we would be saying replicate Guantanamo. We hold a lot of people around the world. None of them have the rights that the courts have insisted on for Guantanamo. And so when you insist on closing Guantanamo, there is a strange irony to that, which is that you're closing the one detention facility that has, you know, in which you can see the semblance, the outlines of what a reasonable long-term process would look like for detention. Now, I'm actually not opposed to closing Guantanamo, and I don't want to leave you with the impression that I'm a sort of, you know, rah-rah Guantanamo. I actually think Guantanamo is 
the question of whether you hold detainees at Guantanamo or whether you hold them somewhere else is actually a deeply unimportant question. To me, the important question is whether you hold detainees outside of the criminal justice system, and if you do, what the set of rules under which you hold them. Um, now, so in other words, if you can create a reasonable detention process and a, and, and, a, and a strong detention process that we can all agree on it as a society, and you want to do that at Guantanamo Bay, that's fine with me. You want to do it somewhere other than Guantanamo Bay, Thompson, Illinois, Bagram, that's fine with me too. The key, in my opinion, is getting the rules right, getting the systems right, and getting the authorities right, if you want to do it at all. And important, making the fundamental decision, do you want to do it at all? If you don't want to do it, then it doesn't matter if you don't do it at Guantanamo or you don't do it somewhere else. And if you do want to do it, get the systems right. And then it also doesn't matter whether you do do it at Guantanamo or whether you do do it somewhere else. This brings us to the question, is this something we should be doing? Detention outside of the normal criminal justice process. Now, this is a very long and complicated conversation, which I'm going to try to distill to about three minutes. Simple answer to this question is all three branches of government under democratic control, under republican control, um, the judiciary isn't under partisan control, but uh, you know the judiciary and both political branches under the control of both political parties have actually pronounced on the question of the legality of extra criminal detention and all three control, you know, cross ideology have said detention is lawful. Um, now that may sound very surprising because we always hear, you know, this is outside the rule of law, this is a law-free zone. The truth is, we have confronted this question repeatedly. In the context of counterterrorism, there's a large and growing body of law on this question. And it arises, ironically, in precisely the habeas cases that you've just heard how often the government is losing. Well, the government has lost a bunch of habeas cases. That's true. It's also won a bunch of habeas cases. And it's actually a lot of the cases, uh, you know, you heard it here first, a lot of the cases that they lost are actually going to, they're going to turn around and win on appeal. That's already started happening. The numbers are right now, I think, quite, quite significantly skewed in the direction of detainees. I don't say that with, with, with joy. I just think that's the direction it's going. The DC Circuit has issued a, a variety of opinions over the last six to eight months. Um, and they have, in almost all of them, taken, or in the major ones anyway, taken positions far more generous to the government than the government has asked it to take. Um, so there's a reorientation now of the habeas district courts going on. There is a reason why the Bush administration and the Obama administration alike have insisted on some extra criminal detention authority. Um, the reason is not that the Bush administration was a lawless bunch of thugs and the Obama administration came in with lofty rhetoric and discovered that in their hearts they were also a lawless bunch of thugs. That's actually not the reason. The reason is that US forces in the fall of 2001 and early 2002 found themselves in Afghanistan <coughs> capturing large numbers of people and large numbers of people who are very hard to distinguish from the civilians around them. When you capture very small numbers of people, you can route them into the criminal justice system and you can process them that way. When you capture very large numbers of people, it doesn't work. Um, prosecution is an enormously labor-intensive project and you have to have some other system. Um, traditionally, in the law of war context, that system is military detention. Now, this is a hybrid context, and that's what makes it so uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, the United States, under whatever party is in control of the White House, under whatever party is in control of Congress, um, and frankly, the courts have you know, been pretty tolerant of this, um, is going to retain some extra criminal detention authority for its overseas military operations. It's just going to happen. And that means that the question of Guantanamo is a bit of a misdirected question, in my opinion. And the real question is, what is the contours of that extra criminal detention authority going to look like? Is it going to be 
there are a lot of options on the table. And, you know, one of them is, and the irony is the incentive structure we've created is keep it very far away from the United States, as in the theater, keep it at relatively closed facilities, keep it the heck away from the federal courts. Um, and that's, you know, one option. It's not an option that I think is attractive, actually. It's, a, it's an option that I think is a weird byproduct of the political debate that we've had and the legal debate that we've had. I think the much more attractive option is to look ourselves in the mirror and say, OK, we don't want to have a pure executive power model of detention, where the president says, I get to say who we detain, and nobody gets to review it. That didn't work. It didn't make anybody comfortable, except people whose comfort probably is not such a great thing. Um, and it lacked uh, very important components of democratic legitimacy, including, by the way, the component of judicial review. Um, if we are going to have detention for the rest of our lives, and I, I'm very comfortable standing here and saying I think we will. I don't think the reason there are 48 people at Guantanamo Bay um, who the administration admits it's not going to ever release. And by the way, there are more than that because, as Andy correctly points out, um, that discounts Yemenis who will be released only if conditions in Yemen substantially improve. And that's kind of counterfactual for the foreseeable future, if not indefinitely. Um, it also discounts the number who are slated to go to trial and will not because we're not actually bringing people to trial very effectively. We're going to have some detention. We also have hundreds of people that we're detaining abroad. We had many, many thousands of people whom we detained in Iraq. Now, it is very easy to pretend that Guantanamo is a unique circumstance, but it isn't. Guantanamo is a very simple function of the problem of what happens when you go around the world and you capture a large number of people and you have to figure out what to do with them. You have to put them somewhere. And once you put them somewhere, that place will have a name. Guantanamo is just the name. So what I would say to you, and I'm going to wrap this up, is the issue is actually not Guantanamo. It was a huge strategic error of the human rights community to make the issue Guantanamo. It was a huge strategic error of Barack Obama's to embrace that. Again, I'm not opposed to closing Guantanamo. You want to close it, fine. Um, but you won't solve a single problem by closing Guantanamo if you don't figure out what your actual detention architecture is going to look like. And finally, that detention architecture is not going to be an architecture based on zero detention outside of the criminal justice system. And that means we have to think about what the architecture that actually authorizes detention is going to look like in the long run. And I'll leave you with one final point. If we do not do that, that architecture will come into existence anyway. And the mechanism by which it will come into existence is these habeas cases. Um, now, I don't know how many of you have ever spent time reading DC Circuit opinions or watching DC Circuit oral arguments. But right now, the DC Circuit is the body that is writing the law of detention. I've spent a lot of time over the last few years studying the law that they are creating. And it is not, in many ways, the law that we, would, we should feel comfortable having written for us. If we don't take responsibility, I'm not saying I'm not criticizing the judges of the DC Circuit. They're, 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 they're interpreting the law as they understand it. And I think a lot of these opinions are correct under current law. They're not the system that we would want to design. And if we don't take responsibility as a society, they're going to write this law. Um, maybe the Supreme Court will get involved at some point. Maybe it won't. But we will not be able to say that we don't have detention. We will not be able to say, we may be able to say that we don't have Guantanamo, but that name will move. And I don't think we will have accomplished very much. And I think we will end up with a detention architecture of which we will not be happy in the long run.
bring us home, Tom. Hi. Well, let, let me say I'm going to try to be very short, and I had absolutely no idea what I was going to say before, and I still don't have much of it done. <laughs> um, um, let me, uh, because I, this is also complicated in the end, I want to try to get it back to something simple. Um, I do think Guantanamo as a symbol is important, and I think it's important that it be closed, because Guantanamo was established for a single purpose, to avoid the law. That's why the Bush administration chose it. They were advised that, you know, uh, if you send people to Guantanamo, they'll be beyond the law. And the Bush administration viewed the law as an impediment in the war against terrorism. I think it's one of the most fundamental mistakes of that administration, that the law is something that we can't live with and deal with, but we need to avoid. That was a terrible thing. I, I want to take a few, um, make a few comments with Ben. And ben and I have been disagreeing for years about this. Uh, but I think you overstate it when you say Guantanamo is the only base where people have habeas. It's the only base. So that's not so. I would say under the law that every base, you, you've got to remember, they chose Guantanamo precisely because it was a base where they said prisoners would not have habeas. We won that. And now I think every base in the world, unless it's in a war zone like Bagram, they would have habeas. So, you know, it's, it is a, uh, but symbolically it's that. You said another thing too, and I just think in, in confusing, uh, you said people will be held at one time now not subject to the law. I don't think you mean that. I, you, you said not subject to criminal prosecution. Yes. It's, it's always been accepted that prisoners of war, people who fight against you, are soldiers. You don't need to criminally prosecute them, and you can hold them until the end of the conflict. Nobody disputes that, and that's fine. I, I think, with all respect to Ben, who I have tremendous respect for, he was the first person to write an editorial in support of us. Uh, uh, but I think much of what you do is sort of like a, um, a solution in search of a problem. I, I don't think much of this is that complicated. I think we need to just try to do What's right? I, I first became involved in Guantanamo at the beginning. I brought the cases that went to the Supreme Court to establish a right of the people down there to habeas corpus. And um, I, I had no idea that we were torturing people or things like that. I just learned that a lot of these people might be innocent, might be wrongly picked up and held there, and they didn't have any hearing. And for, what is it, five or six years, the Bush administration did everything to prevent these people from getting a hearing, just this fair, basic hearing. You know, we argued whether the hearing should be in the courts or, or done uh, by the military, and I said I didn't care. The courts had to stand by to make sure that, that fair hearings were done, whether they were done by the military or not. And the Bush administration nixed the military Article 5 hearings that would be done in the field. And, you know, normally if somebody's picked up in the field and you have no, uh, any doubt about it, the Geneva Conventions and our military regulations mandate a hearing right there. We've always done it before. The, the Navy guys in charge of this wanted to do those hearings. The Bush administration nixed them. So you had basically every Arab who was captured, who was taken into custody in that area, sold for a bounty, was shipped to Guantanamo and never had an opportunity uh, to prove uh, his innocence. And what we fought for in the Rasul and Boumediene cases was a basic right to a hearing. And we finally won that in Boumediene. And the Obama administration came in, and uh, so there have been, I don't know, 40 some habeas cases. The detainees have won more than half of them, even before very conservative judges. Now, maybe the DC Circuit will reverse some of those. But the, the fact is, is everyone knew as as internal reports in the Bush administration said, most of these guys are the wrong guys. They were picked up mistakenly. It established the right of them to have a hearing to prove that. Um, and the Obama administration had a review procedure where they cleared 89 people. They said these people should be released. The sadness today, and the simple thing is, you got 89 people, as Andy started out, down there who were, who were still there. I mean, we should be ashamed of this. We, I, I, am, I am furious and ashamed. I, I, I think Guantanamo is a symbol of sort of fear and weakness. Uh, we started out with Guantanamo out of a hysteria and a fear of terrorism, and Dick Cheney and others decided we'd go to the dark side and we would abandon our principles. 
I consider that weak because I think a strong person in times of threat stands by his principles. It's the easy way out to abandon your principles in times of threat, but we abandon them, and that was tremendous weakness. I see today uh, a terrible uh, weakness too. The fear is different. The fear is now political repercussions. You know, the Obama administration is afraid to stand up and say, God damn it, we got innocent people, you, you release them, you get them home. I don't care if a Republican is going to give you crap. I mean, one of, the, one of the worst things that happened at the beginning of this administration, Greg Craig had a plan to, you know, and I back up on these things. We go to other countries and say, please take these people in. They're innocent people. And most countries say, well, why the hell won't you? Why do we take the political hit if you won't? Why don't you have the courage to do it? Greg Craig recognized this. In the first week, he said, I'm going to take some of these Uyghurs, who the Bush administration said were innocent people, into Virginia, where they have a Uyghur community. Frank Wolf in Virginia objected, and the Obama administration folded, and Greg Craig was fired. What weakness. I mean, Congress just passed a resolution saying nobody from Guantanamo can come to the United States. Not innocent people who we have wrongly held for eight years in, a, you know, in isolation, we won't let them in? That's a shame. That's a stain on us. Somebody should do something about it. So all these other things, what our architecture is in the future, yeah, we got to get it right, but we got to do right now. We got to have the strength to stand up for it. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. I really powerful survey of the landscape uh, on this <clears throat> terrible question. And uh, given the time, given that I know the audience is full of questions, I'm going to waive my own prerogative to ask the first question and open it up right up to the floor. Um, and because I know there's going to be good questions out there, let give people a second to kind of formulate them. And then what I'll do is I'll come back in and, and ask my question when I'm ready. Uh, gentleman here, the dark glasses. Yep. And, and yes, if everyone can uh, just identify uh, their name and then uh, their affiliation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christoph Marshall from the German Daily Der Tagesspiegel. I'm now six years in the United States, have been twice to Guantanamo. Just want to like to um, follow up on what Mr. Wilner said. Uh, we got also this um, paperwork with the statistics, and I stumbled over one of the expressions there, which is totally familiar here in the discussion, return to the battlefield. Are you uh, happy or comfortable with this expression? If Mr. Wilner is right that 80% um, or even more of the detainees in Guantanamo never should have been held there and never were dangerous terrorists, then they are not returning to the battlefield, but maybe turning to the battlefield after the experience of Guantanamo. Do you have any knowledge about that? Do you have statistics about that? And um, should there be a public discussion whether changing this a term which is full of assumptions and um, yeah, assumptions? Thank you. Well, can I, can I say one thing about that quickly? I, and a, one of my clients was this uh, a fellow al Ajmi from who, Kuwait who, after he was released about a year later, went back to Kuwait, and then he blew himself up in Iraq in some Iraqis, which was horrible. I mean, I, I knew al Ajmi. I, I saw his file before. I was absolutely convinced that he did not do anything wrong. And, and uh, you know, a lot of the people who returned, of course, were released by the Bush administration without hearings. You don't know. I was concerned about his release, and I informed uh, people because he had become furious. He had turned at Guantanamo into this sort of madman. And, and I was always struck when they released people, there wasn't, they were sort of let off a plane and, and pushed away. There wasn't an apology. There wasn't anything else. There was no reintegration at that time of them. It was just, okay, you spent your four years, five years here in isolation, go home. So I don't know if this answers your question, but I, look, I'm sure some of the people were Taliban fighters or something who were there and, and were released by the Bush administration without hearings, maybe somewhere now. But there is a great problem. When you treat people like crap, for a long time, and you do nothing about it, I, I think you create a problem. I, you know, um, I have to say that yeah, I mean, I do have a, a problem, obviously, with that. I mean, it, the recidivism thing, the whole labeling is wrong. What concerns me um, more than whether they returned or whether they 
um, encountered a battlefield for the first time or whether they're um, involved in terrorism or all of these um, explanations. What, what concerns me the most, and I'm very glad that the New America Foundation has just produced this report, is that every now and then, generally in the Pentagon, a bunch of people get together and conjure up figures out of nowhere, don't substantiate them, and mainstream media outlets across the country report it as though it was fact. Now, if I gave them a piece of paper with some words on it and no backup for that at all, they would not print it. Um, so it's bad journalism, but it's also, you know, it's ridiculous to me that the Pentagon or, or, or other places can say whatever they want without backing it up in any way, um, and it's treated as though it's acceptable. There's obviously some political purpose behind that. The question of people leaving Guantanamo and whether they were radicalized by their experience or whether they were somebody who has a grudge against America that they'd nursed for all those years, and, um, you know, and a small number of them perhaps engaging in some military activity or in, in some activity against the United States and its interests, you can't possibly, after Guantanamo, expect that you can have a zero recidivism rate. You don't have anything like a zero recidivism rate in any other prison context. Um, I think are we not looking at 60 to 70 percent in the in the um, ordinary prison system. Um, people want it to be zero, and it's part of the reason that people who are playing that fear card are saying, "Well, we you know we really can't release anybody because they might be somebody who's dangerous," and that really is an argument that's being used. And with this moratorium on the Yemenis. Um, where nobody has been released um, except one person, one man, Mohammed Hassan Odaini, last year, who was so patently innocent. He was caught staying the night in a guest house with some students. He'd gone around for dinner and they got talking, so he stayed the night, and that was the night the Pakistani police raided. Um, he was so patently innocent that the administration couldn't appeal that one. They, they thought about appealing that one to the D.C. Circuit Court because, as we've heard, the D.C. Circuit Court will turn down anything at the moment. If you don't want to release Yemenis, send it to the D.C. Circuit Court. Who cares whether they're innocent or not? In this case, they said, we're going to have to let him go. An official who spoke to the Washington Post made a point of saying, we're okay with this because we checked out his family background. He's from a good family. Oh, you don't get released from Guantanamo if you're from a bad family then. Um, you know, recidivists, recidivists come from bad families. You know, I, I'm appalled by this on its own basis, but I'm appalled when I try and make an analogy with the ordinary prison system and imagine the kind of arguments that people would like to make for not releasing people from prison at the end of a sentence which they've been handed down by a judge and jury. Oh, there are plenty of people who would like to say, well, you know, there's a bad guy in prison, he served his sentence, but we really shouldn't let him go. He's from a bad family. He's from a bad neighborhood. Let's just lock them all up forever. Um, it's absolutely acceptable, but it's terrorism and Guantanamo. Put those magic words together, um, and you can play whatever fear card you want. And those fear cards are being played as full-on and horrendously as they were at the height of the hysteria whipped up by the Bush administration. Okay. Ben. So I think, it's, I think it's important to distinguish, um, and I, I think in, in this conversation we often haven't distinguished, between a discretionary decision to release somebody whom you believe to be lawfully detained and a judgment that that person was erroneously detained or is innocent. Um, there have been an enormous number of people released from Guantanamo um, or transferred from Guantanamo by both the last, particularly by the last administration, but also by this administration. Uh, very few of them were released because the administration made the judgment that they were innocent. And so we have the, 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 the sort of tossed around sort of casually the idea that some very large percentage of, of these people um, were in fact innocent. And I actually don't want to have an argument about what percentage are, of them actually are, because I think that's actually quite unknowable based on the public record. Um, I also, but I do think it is very important to distinguish the reasons for a release. And when, when, the, you know, when the administration decides, most releases from Guantanamo have been the f a function of 
individual bilateral arrangements made between the United States and individual countries that f who from wh from which those detainees came. So, for example, um, we had an arrangement with the Saudis, as as Andy described earlier, to release in bulk, irrespective largely of their innocence or guilt. And those concepts are themselves a little bit fuzzy in this context. But essentially all of the Saudis whom we didn't mean to prosecute. Now that, you, you can very casually say, well, that shows they're all innocent, but that's actually not what, what, what drove the decision. And the reason those, there are a lot of Yemenis still at Guantanamo, irrespective of their own, you know, is that no similar, no similar arrangement has been or right now could be made with the government of Yemen. And so th these are, you know, it's very easy to talk about these in the language of innocence and guilt. Um, but this is not actually the way, how a lot of these decisions are being made and that you can criticize that. But the reality is that when you release a large number of people, it doesn't necessarily convey any sense that any of them were innocent. Mo, in terms of the evidentiary record that you had before, you know, for these detainees, what's your sense of how much do we even have any documentation for some for the the caseload? Um, what's your what's your sense? I think it varies tremendously. I mean, I, I guess one thing I found is people tend to stereotype when they talk about detainees like it's a homogenous group of people. And the same like with 9/11 victim families. I think everybody has this notion that all of them are just alike. You know, that, that you know one size fits all. The detainees are a very diverse group. Uh, you know. There were some, I think, like Hamden, for instance, struck me as somebody, you know, he made 100 bucks a month driving for bin Laden, and somebody else offered him 150 drive for, for them. There are others that were thoroughly committed to, to jihad, no matter what you do, they're never going to change their mind. And some, like David Hicks, who I think was just a, an idiot looking for adventure. You know, there's a whole range of different types of people and different, and I guess it depends on what you call evidence. One of the things that really struck me is the difference in law enforcement and intelligence and the friction between the FBI and the CIA. And I'll give you an example, this is a hypothetical. You know, you'd get a piece of information from the field saying, hey, we got a picture of this guy, we're trying to figure out who it is, can you show it to the detainee and get him to identify it? You know, they bring the picture and say, the FBI would say, do you recognize this person? The detainee would go, no, I don't. They go, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure I don't, don't recognize him. Intelligence would come in and go, do you recognize this guy? And he'd say, no. And you go, well, wait a minute. Now, you were at Al Farouk, weren't you, in 2000? And yeah, yeah, I was there. And didn't you meet so-and-so? Yeah, yeah, he was there. Now, if he had a, didn't he have a brother? Well, yeah. So could this possibly be? And when he got right, written up in the summary, the intelligence, the IIR, the sum, or the SIR, the summary report says detainee identified you know, this person. And now that's being used as evidence. You know, you can't. The, you know, the, the detainee can't go interview this guy who's now identified him and say, do you really know me? But it's written up as fact that the detainee have identified this person as being whoever it is, and that's what's being offered up as evidence. So intelligence and evidence are not one and the same. Thanks. Okay. Um, the lady in the back in the middle. Andrew. Phil, thanks. Yep. Uh, Mary Ann McGrail, an attorney in D.C., in the use of, this is for any of the panelists, in the use of Article Three courts uh, uh, for detainees, how, do you, how does one negotiate uh, the Classified in Information Procedures Act and the state secrets privilege? Okay, I think that's, sorry, go ahead. Um, with difficulty. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, they are taken into account. Um, the courts have been, uh, you know, it, it's on a case by case basis. The Classified uh, Information Procedures Act applies, and the State Secrets Act applies, and you try to accommodate them. You know, you, it, at times there have been summaries, at times there have or have not. By and large, we've been deprived of most information. But, at, but, it, but in addition, there's a, um, you know, a, a wrinkle in these cases that doesn't arise in some of the others, because of course, SIPA only applies in the criminal context. And the state secrets privilege 
I'm actually unaware of, of the state secrets privilege ever having been asserted in the context of a habeas case. Um, it, it generally arises, um, and so, you know, the, the, there's the, the, the issues that those various, you know, the, the, that the authorities that you describe implicate show up all the time in these cases, but not in the form of those specific doctrines or, or statutes. Is that, that, that's correct. No, that's it? right. We you really, really use SEPA by analogy and get the courts to push for the same procedures in SEPA for the habeas cases. Okay. Um, right up here in front. Yeah, thank you for those presentations. Uh, my name is Richard Wetzel. I work at the German Historical Institute as a legal historian working, among other things, on Nazi Germany. So I'm quite familiar with systems of government that believe in extra legal forms of detention. Nevertheless, I take the question seriously that um, Ben Wittes asked about extra criminal detention. My question is for the panel as a whole. Am I naive to think that before the Bush administration revived military commissions, there were essentially two ways of detaining someone? One is you can decide in a war that someone is a POW and you detain him or her in a POW camp, or you treat the person as a criminal and you bring criminal charges and, and, and try them before a criminal court. Um, it's always struck me that the Bush administration, admittedly going back to the one precedent that, that Colonel Davis mentioned, essentially invented a new third category that they called enemy combatant. Um, so my question to the panel is, do you sort of also share this view that essentially under most systems that believe in the rule of law, there are only those two choices. Either you try someone as a criminal or you detain him or her as a POW. And then following on to that, to those three of you other than Ben Wittes, how do you deal with the question that Ben Wittes <laughs> posed of extra legal detention? My answer to Mr. Wittes is yes, there are extra criminal forms of detention. They're called a POW camp. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'd just uh, like to say that absolutely that's exactly what I think, and it's what I um, hope somebody would raise as a, a, a following on um, from Ben's discussion of what kind of detention system do we want, and it's called the Geneva Conventions, and it's called Prisoner of War Camp. Um, and I think the, I don't think there is a problem at all. Um, I don't think we've, um, I don't think in general any of us have discussed this in any kind of detail. I think that what happened after 9-11 was that the Bush administration unilaterally discarded the Geneva Conventions. I think we are still living with that um, in zones of military conflict. We're still living with that in Afghanistan. I met a British officer a few years ago who said, what the hell do we do when we capture people in Afghanistan? Because we don't have POW camps. And we have to choose between handing them over to the Americans, who torture people, or the Afghans, who torture people. Um, Bagram is a place where... Um, as a result of um, habeas appeals that were made on behalf of foreign prisoners who were seized in other countries and transferred there and have been held for seven or eight years, um, they won their habeas appeals and then they were taken away. These, these men are in a legal black hole, even though the initial ruling was that they were the same as the Guantanamo prisoners. Bagram is not a place recognizable as a prisoner of war camp under the Geneva Conventions. The, um, the review process, the Bush administration had was that every now and then they would let the guys held there um, make a statement, um, but they had to make the statement before they told them what they were accused of. That's pretty sinister. Well, it was then updated by the Obama administration, so now it resembles the CSRT process at Guantanamo, the combatant status review tribunals that the Supreme Court found inadequate. So that's the process. So I'm asking you, if, if an American... Um, if an American service, service person serving abroad, not wearing a uniform, was captured, wasn't given an Article 5 battle competent tribunal under the Geneva Conventions, was imprisoned in something that looked nominally like a prisoner of war camp, but wasn't, because it involved them being just held, and then maybe somewhere 14, 18 months down the line being given some sort of Mickey Mouse review process, do you think the American government and the American people would be happy with that? No. So the discarding of the Geneva Conventions has been much more widespread than just what happened at Guantanamo. But my fundamental problem with what happened at Guantanamo, and this, was, this really centers on some idiocy that came out of the mouth of Doug Feith. Is that, I'm not sure I got his surname <laughs> right. 
Right. right. Yeah. Who, you know, he was the advocate for saying that because we don't think that these people that we capture, um, that the Geneva Conventions don't apply to them, because he wasn't interested um, in any of the, of the, the Article 5 assessment of people. Um, but what he primarily wasn't interested in was in common Article 3, which guarantees that anybody that you capture must be treated humanely. What he was interested in, what Cheney was interested in, what Addington was interested in, what all these people were interested in was saying, we have analysed this in such a way that there are certain people that you can capture in wartime who have no rights as human beings whatsoever. They are playthings that you can torture. And, and that was what took all those years until the Supreme Court said, guys, the United States can't hold people without giving them common Article 3 protections. Those are universal. So, you know, I think that that still infected it. But, you know, I, I have yet to hear, um, I, you know, Ben knows I don't agree with him, but I have yet to hear um, a, a convincing explanation of why we are in a new world where we don't either have criminal suspects and prisoners of war. Let's hear from Ben. Yeah, as, as, as the only member of this panel who is not not Benjamin Wittes. Yeah, no, no, I, I, to I, I totally understand. Um, I actually think your question, um, I agree with Andy that your question gets to the core of something enormously important and probative here. I disagree entirely with Andy as to the answer to your question. So let, let me try to back up. Um, the, there was a divergence, indeed, between the United States and Europe um, and the United States and a lot of countries over whether a third category existed. But it was not actually, it was a divergence that took place in two phases, one conceptual and the other practical. So at the time that the European countries and most almost the entirety of the rest of the world signed Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, the United States declined to sign it, declined to ratify it. Um, and the reason, the stated reason, that the Reagan administration declined to ratify it is that it would confer, it risked conferring the status of prisoners of war, of prisoner of war onto terrorists. Um, and the United States, if you go back to the Nazi saboteurs case, the, the ex parte Quirin case that, that Mo talked about earlier, the Supreme Court, which, you know, and, and as ugly as the Quirin case is, it was good law at the time, you know, it was the Supreme Court's most recent significant pronouncement on the subject at the time that 2001 happened, right? Um, talks about three, two categories of people you capture, right? There are the people who fight according to the laws of war to whom you are obliged to give certain protections. Now, these protections would have been under the 29 Geneva Conventions, not the 49 Geneva Conventions. And then there's the other category, the people who don't fight according to the rules to whom you are not obliged to give those protections. And the United States, while never exercising that authority in the years after World War II, always carefully preserved the option. Um, and so I think the answer to your question is actually very subtle. It's that the United States, you know, through administrations of both parties, reserved the right of, of, of holding somebody as an unlawful enemy combatant, but never actually did it. And the, the aggressiveness of the Bush administration, and uh, now the aggressiveness also of the Obama administration, is that they actually did what the United States had always preserved the option of doing. Now, I, I think that was partly driven by, you know, a sense we don't need to give these people any rights. But I also think it was partly driven by, by circumstance. Uh, when, when you call somebody a POW, that person has combat immunity. Um, that per that, the, the list of things that you give a POW is extraordinarily protective. And there was a sense in 2001, and I still have that sense. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it. I don't think it was driven by fear. I don't apologize for it. There is a sense that this is perfidious criminal warfare, that I reserve the right to fight as warfare and I reserve the right to prosecute as crime. And this is a hybrid conflict in which you are going to use all elements of federal power um, 
and you're not going to, to you know, give away the status of an honorable soldier to people who, don't, who aren't entitled to it. Now, I accept that that makes the United States exceptional vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the international community. I actually <clears throat> say shame on the rest of the international community. That's a morally important distinction, and I, I stand by it. I, I really am. I, I, let, let me address this because I think, in a sense, it is subtle, and I, it's not as clear-cut as you say. And, and, but I think Ben's got it wrong. The way it comes out. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, and, and you know, here, here's the reason. And Andy got at the end. That um, what does it mean, really, to be a prisoner of war? Is that you can't be prosecuted for murder when you're acting as a soldier? That that's really what it means when you get through it all. Soldiers aren't murderers, they're soldiers. If you follow the rules of war, you are entitled to be treated as a prisoner of war. The United States reserves the right to treat people who don't follow the rules of war, not as prisoners of war, which means really essentially they can be prosecuted as murderers. So what it doesn't mean, though, is that you can hold a person who has not followed the rules of war and it can be prosecuted as a murderer as something less, you know, in, in isolation without the guarantees of, of our common Article 3, which is what the Bush administration did. And the great danger, I think, in the future is how far we expand the military's right to hold people absent criminal trial. Clearly, people who fight against us in a theater and observe the, the laws of war should be held as prisoners of law, uh, prisoners of war. Um, what about somebody in the theater who doesn't observe those rules? Should he be held in that? Or they can be prosecuted. Always could be. Okay. What about somebody far away from the theater, sitting in London doing something bad? Do you hold that person, throw him in as a prisoner of war, never give him a right to a trial? He's a criminal in my view. That's, that's where the issue comes. But you can never say what the Bush administration do is try to have it two ways. They're not prisoners of war, and therefore the Geneva Conventions don't apply so we can crap on them and torture them. That, that makes no sense. We can preserve the right to treat these people, not, not give them the right, but then you need to treat them accordingly. I hope that. Mo, did you want to weigh in? No, it's, you know, again, I think the whole purpose of Guantanamo was not with a view towards prosecution. It was a view towards collecting intelligence. And if they're POWs, we wanted more than name, rank, and serial number out of these guys. Mm -hmm. Prosecution was way down the list of priorities. It was getting information. If you haven't read it, I think Karen Greenberg's book called The Least Worst Place. You know, in the absent, I can take the military has great respect for the Geneva Conventions. We don't, unlike Attorney General Gonzalez, we don't view them as quaint. And the military, for the first number of months, even when Camp X ray, which has become the iconic image of Guantanamo, the military was applying the Geneva Conventions. And so I think the military has a great deal of respect for it. It was the artful, legal, you know, meandering of the Bush administration to come up with this new category where we could try to collect intelligence. But the FBI, in my view, has done a great job of complying with the rule of law and collecting useful evidence and intelligence without having to resort to these extraordinary processes. Great. Thanks. Uh, the gentleman, the hat in the back. If you can wait for the microphone, sir, and identify yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Goodnell. I'm a member of Veterans for Peace. I'd like to address this question to Ben. Ben, I think you erroneously said, and I don't know what your background on researching this was, but you made mention that you, I believe, thought that most of the men being held in Guantanamo were captured by American forces. It's my understanding, I heard one of the gentlemen use the word bounty, and as I understand it, most, if not all, of the detainees there came in under the time when we had to deck our cards out with the faces on this and that. Our government offered a bounty, and most of them came in with bounties of five, ten, and fifteen thousand dollars being paid to their fellow countrymen or people nearby that turned these people in to an American service person on the ground. Now, I'd like to know where due process fits in here. And again, with you, sir Ben, I do care who's innocent and who's not. And I'm very, very glad some points were made up because the way we're treating these men and okay. Guantanamo and the ones we did in Abu Ghraib is a discern to my fellow brothers and sisters who are in combat now because they can face the same thing, sir. How do you reply thank, to that? Thank you, sir. Um, 
on your factual point regarding the balance of uh, who captured the people in uh, currently at Guantanamo, I, I think the the plurality were captured by Pakistani forces as people ca ca crossed the border or tried to cross the border. Uh, the Northern Alliance certainly captured a bunch, and there were definitely bounties paid in some cases. I have no doubt of that. Um, I didn't mean to suggest when I said that the United States forces, you know, captured a bunch of guys that they were lit every single one of them was literally captured by a U.S. service personnel. What I meant is in operating in a, in a theater all of a sudden in which we weren't, you know, hadn't been anticipating operating, we came into custody of a large number of people, a very l much larger number, by the way, than ever showed up at Guantanamo. Um, on your point, I, I certainly never meant to suggest that I don't care who's innocent or guilty. Um, what I meant to say, and I think what I did say, um, was that the decision to release somebody is not an exoneration. And there have been a very large number of people released from Guantanamo or transferred from Guantanamo. And I actually agree completely with Mo. The, the, the population at Guantanamo is enormously diverse. It ranges from people who are um, unambiguously some of the scariest people in the world to people who were clearly rounded up by mistake. And, and you know, I don't, I don't think, I've never spoken to anybody in the military who says, oh, if we'd known who those Uyghurs were, we would have grabbed them. You know, <laughs> that, that's, you know so, so that's, that's the range that you're actually dealing with. You're dealing with a lot of low-level people who were in very sort of, in, in to one degree or another, affiliated with, with uh, or nearby or involved with bad people, and we kind of don't know exactly what they were up to. I'm sorry? No, I'm, t I'm telling you what I think I know having read every habeas case that's come down. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you what I know having read a lot of the transcripts of a lot of the things that are available. Um, and so what I'm telling you is that, th is that th the population is an enormous range um, and that the decision to release somebody is sometimes a decision that they were not lawfully held, but far more often it's a decision that they may be law, we may have a, l a legal right to hold them, but we have a tactical ability, we have the ability to transfer them at this point. We think we can make arrangements that will effectively mitigate whatever danger that we pose, they pose, and we're going to take advantage of that. That's what I think the decision to transfer about 600 people means in, in, in the vast majority of those cases. Okay, let me just, to back it, uh, of the people released, 90% were released by the Bush administration or some, without hearings. And there's no doubt a lot of the, sometimes it was political. Karzai pushed for people to be released, and we know that some of the people who were released were Taliban. Uh, you know, so I, I think that's, you know, a lot of people were released for political reasons or other reasons before there were hearings. So. Great. Um, with everyone's permission, I'm going to extend this to 515, and then uh, we're going to take a couple more questions. Um, the uh, Sir, right here in the yellow sweater. At one time, I took great pride in having been an officer of the United States Army. You better tell everyone who you are, Ray. Uh, I'm Ray McGovern Thanks, Ray. Uh, with Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. <laughs> um, you said correctly that the Army fought tooth and nail, and so did the Marines, so did the Navy, so did everyone else, the Air Force, uh, against what Rumsfeld was trying to do. Now, in November of 2002, all the armed services folded, starting with General Myers and every one of those people who so courageously opposed what Rumsfeld was trying to do, they caved. The only one that stood up was, was Mora from the Navy, and he did indeed succeed in getting Rumsfeld's initial orders curtailed. Uh, I guess it's a mournful question that I ask, but what has become of the top brass of our armed services? I can't speak to the you know, one thing that came up I think is a direct result of this was for the judge advocates general you know the, the senior attorney in each of the services at the time were two stars 
most of the major decisions in the Pentagon are made, I mean, as you know, there are a number of meetings that if you don't have three stars, you don't get in the door. So a lot of the major decisions that were made, there were no uniformed attorneys present. Now, I can tell you the judge advocates general were unanimous in opposing what the Bush administration did, but they were shut out of most of the meetings where the decisions were made. As a result of that, Senator Lindsey Graham really drove the effort, but the judge advocate generals now are three stars to ensure they do get a seat at the table when these kind of decisions are being made. But I know General Jack Rives was the Judge Advocate General of the Air Force, which was my service, and he did a, a memorandum in 2002 saying these techniques that you're about to approve, people can be prosecuted for what, you know, th these techniques you're about to employ. And it was the civilian political appointees. It really ticks me, you know, I'm getting off on a rant here, but. <laughs> It really annoys me, like the Dick Cheney's and the Rush Limbaugh's and the Glenn Beck's who never served a day in the military, yet they're, they claim the title patriot. They're patriots, and if you don't agree with them, then you're unpatriotic. Why did those generals quit? Why didn't they speak out? Why didn't they go to WikiLeaks? Why didn't they act like patriots rather than automatons? That I can't say. I can tell you, you know, for me, when I had my day of reckoning, I resigned. Yeah, you're talking to the guy who quit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, sir. There we go. Uh, my name is Todd Pierce. I'd like to hear the uh, German legal historian perhaps comment on this, but uh, it seems like one of the members of the panel just a couple of questions ago articulated the German military's position back when they were occupying uh, Yugoslavia and France and Norway in World War II. And one of the things that uh, they were later convicted of, or different officers, were uh, failure to give fair trial rights to uh, detainees. In fact, under the Geneva Conventions, and this is a question, isn't it a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions to fail to give fair trial rights to detainees, in other words, a war crime? And if, that, if the answer to that is yes, would anybody want to comment on how many attorneys who have been involved with this process have themselves committed war crimes, perhaps even some uh, who have articulated this position that uh, they should not get fair trial rights who are sitting on the panel right now. Well, in addition, you know, aside from commenting on the particular question, and you're right, um, you need to give protections if you're convicting people. I mean, you need to give due process protection. But you really, your question really raises a larger point that we've skirted, and that is the question of accountability. I mean, I don't see how we can walk around the world, Andy said it so well, whether it's criticizing, you know, whoever for what they do, if we don't demand accountability for the, or I think Mo did, saying that, you know, you got to, you're supposed, you have a duty to prosecute torture crimes. You have a duty to do this. I, you know, I sit around and I, I see what the, and I think in large part the lawyers were responsible for what happened here, Addington and, uh, Feith and, and these guys, they sat around and they, they interpreted the law to misinterpret it purposely. They purposely said, we're not going to go out and try to have Congress change the law. We're going we're to get around it. We're going to misinterpret it. That, to me, is, uh, as a lawyer, is just appalling. And nobody seems to hold them to account. Um, I think if we're going to hold our head up around the world, we need to have some accountability. Again, you know, I remember the beginning, the Obama administration you know, the big debate was the Obama administration going to push for investigations and accountability. They said, oh, no, let's go forward. And hell, now they're even having innocent people at, at Guantanamo. I think we need to uh, have investigation. We need to have our truth commission at the least. Thanks. Okay, one more from the field. How are we doing? Okay. The lady in the red. Uh, I'm Helen Raffel, retired attorney and human rights activist. But I would like, this has been extraordinary and so informative and emotional. I would like to lift it off of the educational level and ask you what you want us in the audience to do. What is the response scream, that you hope to get by having this Scream for people to be event? strong and do what's right. No, We're, no, this no, country, know, I'm sick in this country that we, that we pull our punches. I, I think it's so weak that we go around and we don't do, it is right to let innocent people go. It's wrong to torture. Let's stand up for it again and say it and demand it. 
write letters, do everything, scream it, but everybody sits down, they're worried about the economy, they're worried about, uh, there's certain things that go to the soul of this nation, what this nation stood for to start with. I mean, we're, I, I say it, but we're the only nation founded deliberately on principles of freedom and the rule of law. We're different from other nations, and we're letting that go. So. <laughs> okay, and on that note, I think I'm going to wrap up for today. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks all to our panelists. Yeah. 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 Yeah.